The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello everyone, I'm Vicki Healy with the National Renewable Energy Laboratory and I'd like to welcome you to today's webinar hosted by the Clean Energy Solutions Center. Our discussions today are focused on hybrid renewable energy grids. These mini grids have great potential for improving sustainable and affordable energy access. Yet support for these new technologies requires a different set of policies from tr traditional electrification programs. And this webinar will explain these differences and describe the requirements of sustainable mini-grid electrification um, programs. Uh, next slide, please. Um, before we get started, I, there's one important note to mention that I, I need to state, and that is um, a disclaimer. Basically, the Clean Energy Solutions Center does not endorse or recommend specific products or services, and the information provided in this webinar is featured in the Solutions Center's resource library as one of many informative and best practice resources that are, that are researched and provided by um, our technical experts. Uh, next slide, please. Um, I'd just like to go over a few quick uh, housekeeping items. Um, so before we begin, I'll just go over some of the webinar features. For audio, you have two options. You may either listen through your computer or over your telephone. And if you choose to listen through your computer, please select the mic and speakers option in the audio pane. By doing so, um, this will eliminate the possibility of feedback and echo and other types of background noises. And if you select the telephone option, a box on the right side will display the telephone number and the audio pin you should use um, to dial in. And we also ask that you please mute your audio device before the presentations begin. And one last very important note, if you're having any technical difficulties with the webinar, um, you may contact the GoToWebinars Help Desk, and that phone number is 888-259-3826. Uh, they're, they're very helpful and they'll be happy to ha uh, provide you assistance if you're having any difficulties. Uh, next slide. Um, one more item to go over. Uh, we do encourage attendees to participate in the webinar by asking questions and also providing relevant comments. And if you would like to ask a question or add a comment, we ask that you use the questions pane where you may find where you may find in the again in the right hand box on the right hand side of the screen. And there you can type in your question. Also, if you're having difficulty viewing the materials through the webinar portal, you can find PDF copies of the presentations at cleanenergysolutions.org forward slash training. And um, you can access the PDFs there and follow along as our speakers present. Also, I just want to let you know that an audio recording and copies of the presentations will be posted to the Solution Center training page within a few weeks. Uh, so you can go back and listen um, or, and review the presentation at another time. Uh, next slide, okay, agenda. Um, first of all, we really do have a terrific agenda prepared for you today. And this agenda will focus on hybrid renewable energy grids their importance in providing energy access, and the types of policies and programs that support this technology. Um, before our speakers, Peter Lilienthal and Rashinda Van Nguyen begin their presentations, I'm going to provide a short informative overview of the Clean Energy Solutions Center initiative. And then following the presentations, we'll have um, a question and answer session, and then we'll follow up with uh, just wrap up and discussion and a few closing remarks. Next slide, please. Okay, this slide uh, provides just a bit of background in terms of how the Solution Center came to be. The Solution Center is an initiative of the Clean Energy Ministerial, and it is supported through a partnership with UN Energy. Uh, the initiative was launched in April of 2011 and is primarily led by Australia, the United States, and other SIM countries. Uh, outcomes of this unique partnership include support of developing countries through enhancement of resources and policies relating to energy access. We offer no-cost expert policy assistance and peer-to-peer -peer learning and training tools um, such as the webinar you are attending today. Uh, next slide, please. The Solution Center has uh, four primary goals. First, it serves as a clearinghouse of clean energy policy resources, such as reports, tools, um, 
analysis and um, various things of that nature related to clean energy policy. Um, it also serves to share policy best practices, the data analysis tools um, that I just mentioned. Uh, the Solution Center delivers dynamic services that enables expert assistance, learning, and peer-to-peer -peer sharing of experiences. And lastly, the center fosters dialogue on emerging policy issues, such as um, um, our mini you know, renewable hybrid mini grids, as is one of our emerging policy issues that we're addressing, and innovation occurring around the globe. Uh, as far as our audience, our primary audience is energy policy makers and analysts from governments and technical organizations in all countries, but we also strive to engage with the private sector, um, NGOs, and civil society. Next slide, please. Um, one uh, important, and this is really our marquee feature that the Solutions Center provides, is expert policy assistance. Um, we call this Ask an Expert, and it's a very valuable service offered through the Solutions Center. We have established a broad team of over 30 experts in um, clean energy policy areas from around the globe who are available to provide remote policy advice and analysis to all countries and the service is provided to requesters at no cost. So if you have a need for policy assistance on microgrids, smart grids, regulations, renewables, energy efficiency, clean transportation, or any other clean energy sector, we welcome and we encourage you to, to use this um, very valuable service. And again, just to reiterate, this assistance is provided free of charge. And to request the assistance is very simple. Um, you may submit your request by registi registering through our Ask an Expert feature at cleanenergysolutions.org forward slash expert. And there's a little uh, icon there uh, that states ask a question. That's all you need to do is click on that and submit your question. And I will receive that question and respond to you quickly. And we also invite you to spread the word about this service to those in your networks and organizations. Uh, next slide. So uh, a few ways about how you can become involved with the Solution Center. Uh, first, we ask you to explore and take advantage of the Solution Center resources and services, including the expert policy assistance. You can subscribe to our newsletter, um, participate in webinars, as you are doing today. Um, and we welcome you to recommend relevant resources. And we invite you to test and provide feedback on um, some of our tools that we've developed, for example, our Global Renewable Energy Opportunity Tool, which you'll find a link um, to that tool in this slide. Um, and it's uh, you know, currently available on our website. So we welcome your um, usability testing and feedback on this particular tool. Uh, next slide, please. We also have what we uh, call our policy forum discussions, and we encourage you to read and comment on the blogs and articles that are located on our policy forum page. And on this page, you will find many interesting and informative articles discussing progress of clean energy policy development and implementation occurring in countries all around the world. And we also follow similar articles posted by our partners at the Renewable Energy and Energy Efficiency Partnership, also known as REAP. We follow uh, articles on Leonardo Energy, and we follow podcasts that are developed by Bloomberg New Energy Finance. Uh, next slide, please. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce our speakers for today. Um, and, and I'm very pleased to introduce Dr. Peter Lilienthal, who is President and CEO of Homer Energy. And uh, also we are joined by Rashinda Van Leeuwen, who is the Executive Director of the Energy Access Initiative, overseeing the UN Foundation's work on energy access and its engagement with UN Sustainable Energy for All initiative. Uh, Rashinda is our first presenter today, and I would like to turn over the presentation to her at this time. Uh, Rashinda, welcome. Thank you very much, uh, Vicky, and thank you for that introduction. And I just want to in, uh, sort of reiterate the value of the Clean Energy Solutions Center um, experts uh, in, in terms of helping provide guidance around uh, policy for microgrids and, and other aspects of energy for all as well. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit from the context of the Sustainable Energy for All initiative uh, about um, our, our view on uh, micro and mini-grid uh, 
hybrid renewables for energy access. Next slide, please. So um, within the context of the UN Sustainable Energy for All initiative, we're really focusing on how to address the fact that 1.3 billion people around the world today still have no access to electricity. Um, and uh, globally, we've had a lot of support through the UN uh, in the last couple of years, particularly around making energy access a target for a combination of uh, development uh, expertise, of governments, of uh, public and private partnership as well. The UN has recently declared 2014 to 2024 as the decade of sustainable energy for all and has put a large global goal around um, ensuring universal energy access um, uh, is achieved by 2030 um, and uh, as well as doubling the global rate of improvement in energy efficiency and also doubling the use of renewable energy in the global energy mix by 2030. Next slide, please. So just some more context uh, for the overall um, Sustainable Energy for All initiative. One of the key focal areas within the initiative is specifically looking at distributed electricity solutions. Next slide, please. Within this, um, as we've been modeling and looking at how do we achieve universal energy access, the role of mini-grids or microgrids, um, and again, there's, there's no uh, set universal definition, I'll come to that in a moment, around what constitutes a mini-grid or a micro-grid. Um, but the International Energy Agency, uh, in its 2010 World Energy Outlook, really stressed the role as they see for mini-grids in terms of the contribution to additional generation power in order for the world to achieve universal energy access by 2030. Uh, and a lot of the investment that will be required also uh, concurrently is um, on the right side of the of this slide uh, also is going to be specifically on mini grids and we are seeing increasing global interest um, in the configuration of mini grids the business case and the financing uh, for these types of solutions next slide please um, in terms of our work specifically at the UN Foundation we launched a energy access practitioner network in 2011 uh, in support of the Sustainable Energy for All initiative. And we've had very rapid growth with the network to now more than 1,000 individual members. And we're focusing particularly on market-based sustainable energy applications and specifically looking at renewable and hybrid mini and off-grid solutions and catalyzing energy service delivery at country level, again, towards achieving universal energy access. Um, we promote new technologies, we provide advocacy on supportive policies, um, financing and new business models, and also help very actively to broker new partnerships and then disseminate best practices. And I want to specifically mention the work of the network because we have a working group focused on mini slash microgrids, which has 100 members currently with strong technical and knowledge sharing capacity. And for the purposes of this webinar, uh, neither of the presenters this morning, neither Peter nor I, are going to go into a lot of technical detail around um, microgrid design and implementation. Um, but our working group has um, very, very strong technical capability. So for those of you who may have very specific questions, then we really do encourage you to join the network and also ask our other network members how they may have solved specific design, installation, capacity issues. Um, and we have a very strong um, uh, knowledge sharing um, uh, capability among our membership. Next slide, please. Last year, um, through the network, through the membership, we also, uh, at the Rio Plus 20 Summit in 2012, came up with specific recommendations from the membership, identifying five areas as they saw it for particular importance of scaling up energy access. And one of those was very much advancing mini and microgrids around the world, particularly for those areas that have no access to electricity. But Peter will also talk about the application where we have um, an incumbent energy source such as diesel um, and looking to bring on renewable components for that. Next slide, please. So what is a microgrid? As I've already mentioned, there is no universal def definition with a size classification. Um, there's a definition, though, that we 
we are using um, that has come from the U.S. Energy Storage Technology Advancement Act um, here in the U.S. Um, within the context of the network, the practitioner network, we are generally looking at smaller scale microgrids, um, particularly configured for energy access. And I will give a couple of uh, case studies um, before the end of the presentation. Um, so we are, we are generally looking at, I would say, sub one megawatt uh, installations. I think Peter is also again going to talk about some larger installations. And as we've seen, they can go down to a, even as small as a one kilowatt wind turbine that is connected to a um, community um, setting for providing uh, electricity to a, a certain number of households and perhaps a, a school or a um, doctor's clinic. So we can go down, I would say, um, as, as low as one kilowatt uh, and all the way up to a megawatt. In terms of in terms of where the network is predominantly focusing, uh, clearly there are other um, configurations as well uh, that can go larger. Next slide, please. So um, a modern microgrid, um, although microgrids aren't new, they they may include renewable um, and some fossil fuel based generation, particularly where diesel may already be there, or there is a requirement the the energy st stability. Um, and the, the generation capacity has to be absolutely um, uh, maintained, um, for example, for a cell phone base tower or, for example, in a district hospital where you need to be able to have absolutely um, sustained power generation in order to provide um, emergency medical care um, and other types of medical care. Um, looking at energy storage facilities and control um, aspects, one of the key areas that we are all looking at is uh, the capacity for being scalable, either scalable in the context of the community so that you can um, add on additional generation to meet potentially growing loads without compromising the operation of the existing grid, um, and also scalable in terms of uh, replicable. Um, we're very much looking at, uh, um, although there's a lot of customization in mini grids, we're also looking at the extent to which there can be um, perhaps more um, uh, plug and play aspects where we can roll these out uh, in different uh, contexts and geographies um, with perhaps some more standardization of components. Um, typical off-grid energy resources, um, wind and solar combined with diesel, um, some solar, purely solar mini grids now, um, uh, CHP systems and also bio, biomass gasification. Um, as well as microhydro, which is uh, very well known already in terms of uh, um, how microgrids uh, using microhydro are operated. Next slide, please. So some key issues to consider, um, ownership and governance, um, whether it's owned by government, whether it's owned by a cooperative, uh, whether it's a, a central utility, or whether it's a, a private individual or company. These will, um, the, the governance, the ownership will uh, change very much uh, uh, many of the, the dynamics of, of how the microgrid should and can operate, um, particularly in terms of the customer relationship. So um, again, depending on the type of ownership, uh, as the slide shows, that um, there, there is either an obligation to serve all residents or it's more on a capacity to pay. Um, it can be dependent on um, also uh, perhaps a certain amount of, of uh, uh, government obligation through a social protection uh, system to provide some sort of um, threshold of uh, generation um, free of charge beyond which somebody can uh, pay um, to gain additional um, electricity. Or um, it can be completely privately operated. Um, in which uh, it's, it's the regulators who define the customer relationship. Um, again, in terms of the regulation, it varies very much uh, country to country. Um, in some, um, independent power producers are actually not um, able to um, operate. Um, in some countries, uh, they are uh, able to operate, but the policy and the regulation has not yet caught up with the practice on the ground. Um, in other countries, in fact, uh, for smaller systems, um, they fall within a very different regulatory framework than perhaps uh, those larger microgrids 
that may eventually have interoperability with the national grid. Next slide, please. So key, key issues uh, to consider, again, uh, regulation of the microgrid, who owns it, who has the responsibility for um, maintaining it, um, uh, is it the central utility, what is the relationship between the central utility and the um, independent power producer, um, where is ultimately where is the, uh, the, the regulatory responsibility. Um, this, this also very much determines the sources of capital that are used to establish the microgrid, whether it's through uh, tax revenues, whether it's a, a government um, bonds or debt, um, whether it's a foreign assistance, um, whether it's um, private sector investment. Um, and again, this has been one of the key challenges I think that we have seen through the practitioner network is um, the investment, uh, the capital investment that's required to be able to install a microgrid, even though um, over time, um, in fact, the operating costs for a renewable energy uh, hybrid microgrid are going to be um, significantly less than a um, fossil fuel-based diesel grid. And, and again, I think Peter is going to um, provide some more context on, uh, on how the price, uh, the price points are changing very rapidly. Next, next slide, please. So again, uh, questions around covering the cost of, operating of the mi operation of the microgrid. Um, again, is, is, the, is the requirement uh, around tax revenues? What are the connection fees? What are the customer charges? Also, what is, the, um, what is the obligation around service and maintenance? And again, in a typical power purchase agreement, that's very well laid out. One of the challenges that we see is that for these um, microgrids in many developing countries, there is no um, uh, PPA environment that's necessarily already very well articulated. And um, again, uh, by country to country, the the structure of what the PPA or the PPA equivalent may look like varies, and, and therefore um, there are many different um, types of obligation regarding uh, the operation of the microgrid. Um, the next, next issue is customer demand meeting capacity to pay. Um, again, there are many microgrids that have been set up in the past, um, again, often using diesel where, in fact, um, and, and sometimes renewables as well, where there may be um, only the ability to provide six to eight hours per day of electricity, um, and yet, at the same time, there's a demand for uh, a lot more generation capacity. On the one hand, um, on the other side, uh, we've seen examples, um, particularly companies like um, Electricité de France in, in Mali, who have operated um, microgrids to provide energy access in rural environments in Mali. Um, and yet the, the challenge has been um, the capacity to pay for the community and really the ability to, um, to make the, 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 the uh, microgrid financially viable over time. Um, demand side management, this is a key area. Um, again, it, it's uh, perhaps self-evident, but we see time after time that the microgrid really needs to be um, uh, streamlined with effective demand side management as well. So a lot of the work that we are looking at now uh, is in healthcare settings. So ensuring that it, we're not just providing additional generation capacity, but that we are able to um, bring in best of class um, energy efficient appliances, uh, whether that's a digital x-ray machine or um, other types of uh, updated efficient appliances that have the ability to help to um, have more effective load management, particularly in a very low constrained environment. Um, regulatory op operations of the microgrid, again, um, different obligations to provide power service, whether in islanded mode or potentially if connected to a central grid for, for backup or standby power. Next slide, please. So some of the barriers and challenges that members of our network have highlighted um, as, as impeding uh, their work in terms of the installation and operation of some microgrids, lack of enabling policy frameworks. Um, again, I've touched on this already. Some of the regulations around um, encouraging smaller grid systems or um, 
how uh, if there is a subsidy environment, what kinds of subsidies should be working for what kinds of size of microgrids. Um, and again, the question about uh, planning around um, is the grid really expected to come over the next 10 to 15 years? And if so, what happens to the microgrid? Is there a capacity for it to be integrated with the, the larger grid? Or um, what, what is the, what is the um, policy framework um, in which the microgrid operator has some sort of guarantee around being able to continue um, to receive revenue uh, even if the grid um, should come and it bypasses uh, their local grid. So there's a lot of uh, very difficult issues to, to work through there. Um, next area is lack of information on viable financial and business models that can be replicated and brought to scale. That's one of the areas that at the network we are trying to um, essentially cover the universe of the types of models that are out there uh, right now and share knowledge among practitioners so that they can each learn from each other around design, installation, operation um, of, these, of these microgrids. So again, we really encourage those of you who are not already members of the network to join the network um, to be able to share um, certain aspects of, uh, of your uh, experience with, with other practitioners. And again, the need for long-term support for operations and management of microgrid systems. Um, this is particularly relevant for some of the smaller operators um, who perhaps have come in more on a concessional basis and have installed a, installed a power generation source, but they have not necessarily um, come and really worked out the, um, the long-term maintenance of the system. Again, I've seen examples of this um, on, uh, uh, in Central America where um, small wind uh, systems have been installed, but, it, but there's no regulatory environment, there's no uh, power purchase agreement per se, it's really been installed for the community. But the question of the structuring around who pays the access to spare parts um, and the ongoing uh, maintenance of the system then becomes paramount. Um, lastly, uh, the lack of mandatory international standards for mini grids and system components um, is an area that we are beginning to work on um, uh, with some of the international standards bodies uh, looking at um, what, what should be the international standards for this type of the components and as well as the installation and maintenance um, of these, uh, these mini-grids. Next slide, please. So just to give a couple of uh, case studies for members of our practitioner network who are working um, on installing microgrids in different contexts. Uh, the first one that I had the pleasure of visiting in uh, Dakar, uh, outside Dakar in Senegal, um, last November is Inensis, a German company who is partnering with GIZ um, and the uh, um, Rural Electrification Agency of Senegal, ASER, to establish a pipeline of mini-grids in 30 sites in Senegal using a public-private partnership model. Um, they've installed their first microgrid, which is a 15 kilowatt um, wind, solar, diesel uh, microgrid outside Dakar, um, serving a community uh, that is about two hours outside of Dakar um, to meet their community basic uh, electricity requirements. Um, within that business model, uh, there have been certain aspects around the negotiation with the community to really bring them in as an engaged stakeholder, um, setting up a village committee to oversee the, the way that the installation happens and also to negotiate around um, uh, certain uh, requirements, um, such as uh, even as far as um, the, the siting of the system, who, who brings the land, who provides the land for the system, how is that uh, um, financed, um, the, the installation in the village, making sure such things as um, the different boxes are far enough um, the, that the wires, everything is out of reach of children in the village. Um, then on to looking at how we um, work with um, the types of technology for um, smart metering, which is uh, Inensis has been providing to be able to keep the grid stable and provide the amount of power that the community needs um, through, through the day and the night. Looking also at the key community load requirements to ensure, in fact, that uh, they can um, provide the needed power. 
And then last, uh, which has been a challenge, is looking at the tariff model to um, really provide reliability of planning to customers and, and also to enhance us as a power provider. And one of the challenges has been just uh, that there was, um, it took time to negotiate the, the tariff agreement with, um, with ASER, um, although I believe that that has been worked out now. Um, so in this particular uh, case study, even though Enensis is coming in as a private sector um, company to install these mini grids for this first mini grid, uh, I think the, the relationship with GIZ has been um, very uh, necessary to provide some of the initial low risk capital to enable them to do the installation and work out some of the uh, issues around the tariff setting um, so that, in fact, they can then focus on a more commercial and easier rollout for the project pipeline um, of some 30 other sites they've identified in Senegal. So um, that's one. And please, next slide. That, that is the, uh, the microgrid um, generation station in Senegal. Next slide, please. And that is, uh, that is uh, just a, a, a diagram of the um, types of power provision. Um, as you will see, it provides some power to the school, to their local medical center um, for cell phone charging, and then also for um, home use, uh, particularly for lighting and also small appliances like uh, televisions as well. Next slide, please. Uh, next uh, uh, practitioner case study is OMC Power in uh, operating in Uttar Pradesh in India, which has a very different type of um, uh, configuration. It, it builds, owns, and operates micro power plants, um, and it really has a, a dual customer base. On the one hand, they have an 18 kilowatt solar plant and are working with um, provision of power for uh, cell phone um, uh, telecoms base stations. Um, at the same time, they are working with uh, providing a, um, a sort of a business in a box type of opportunity for local entrepreneurs to uh, run their own um, uh, local uh, franchise to provide power to, to households and community customers. So in their, in their configuration, essentially, the telecom base station becomes the anchor tenant. Um, and at the same time, um, the power is sold through local entrepreneurs who rent out uh, lanterns and power boxes and other products to the local community. So they're looking at essentially having a dual revenue stream um, in, uh, in that part of India. Uh, next, next slide, please. And just to show, this is the micro power business in a box um, that they have uh, established um, for, uh, for the local entrepreneurs then to be able to on-sell the, the power and the, uh, the energy services to um, local customers. Um, next slide, please. So some lessons learned, uh, just in conclusion. Um, the technologies are available. Um, what we need really is to do is to make the business case for renewable microgrids, again, particularly on the investment side, looking at um, how to lower risk um, in terms of initial capital costs, what kind of revenue streams, whether through an anchor tenant or whether through a combination of anchor tenants and uh, community customers with variable capacity to pay um, is provided. Do you provide 24-7 power? Do you provide more constrained power? What is, what is really the need of the community today? And also um, mapping out what uh, likely requirements will be, will be needed uh, 10 years on from now as well. Um, price points are rapidly changing, so that changes the economics uh, very much as well, um, again, as Peter will talk about. Um, next is um, really looking at the commercial entities such as the telecom base station or potentially a community facility such as a health clinic as an anchor tenant um, to ensure um, uh, stability, but also looking at the capacity for backing out existing diesel generation. Um, at the UN Foundation, we are leading a part of the Sustainable Energy for All initiative specifically looking at the nexus of energy and, and health, uh, particularly women's health, 
and the World Health Organization has recently identified that up to 40% of health clinics in 11 countries where they are operating in sub-Saharan Africa um, have no access to any electricity um, so far. And so the policy formulation as we're looking at these microgrids also really needs to be um, interdisciplinary. We tend to work in the energy sector obviously through ministries of energy, um, but we really need to look at the um, the different aspects bringing in ministries of health, whether federal or also at the local level, um, at the municipal level, to, looking, to look at um, how we best able to uh, meet the requirements for the community um, and also for uh, um, household as well as uh, uh, public goods, if you will, um, at the community level, whether it's a hospital, whether it's a health center, or also um, on the educational side, whether it's a school. So really looking, lastly, at um, monetizing the socioeconomic benefit of electrification to communities with access, without access to health care. So one of the things that we've been looking at, for example, is just very simply um, how having light in a, um, a health out outpost may save the life of a woman who is ex um, being able to, uh, who, who is in childbirth and experiences some challenges with her delivery, even very small amounts of electricity to run things like uh, fetal heart rate monitors and other small appliances for doctors or nurses to be able to use, even being able to charge their cell phone to call in extra help um, if, uh, if uh, a, a woman is experiencing problems in labor. These are some of the socioeconomic benefits that we see come from having um, a reliable source of power in the community that are not necessarily generally monetized um, in terms of the, um, the, the, the purely investment case, um, but from a broader development perspective are some of the key benefits that we see from being able to uh, provide these solutions. Next slide, please. So please, um, if you haven't already, please do join us uh, as part of the Energy Access Network and uh, we're available at www.energyaccess.org. You can also follow us um, on Twitter as well. Um, you can follow me on Twitter, uh, but the Practitioner Network as well uh, has a Twitter account. So thank you very much. And Peter, um, over to you now to uh, provide some background and information on HOMA. Uh, okay, thank you very much, Rishenda. Uh That was a great introduction. And thank you also to Vicky and the whole team for setting this up. Give me a second to um, uh, some, uh, get my screen um, set up here. And hopefully you all are seeing my first slide. Um, yeah, great. Well, um, so um, <clears throat> let me go to my next slide and just jump right in and start talking a little bit about um, <clears throat> our experience with mini grids or micro grids. Uh, mostly it's built around this software Homer, uh, which was developed at the uh, National Renewable Energy Lab starting in 1993 with the Village Power Program at that time. Uh, and about 10 years ago, we started making it available to the public and it sort of took off and we, um, in 2009, spun Homer Energy off as a private company to support our global user base of over 86,000 users at this point in, in pretty much every country in the world. Uh, and the relevant piece of this is that Almost all of those Peter? Do we lose Peter? Can we take a few minutes for questions while we wait for Peter to get back on the line? Yeah, that would be great. So, okay, great. Um, I'm just going through, and there was one question. Um, I 
came in, Rashinda, uh, specifically, you know, for you. Um, and the question is, do we have a tried and proven management and monitoring tool or tools for renewable energy mini uh, grids on islands? Um, if I can speak to that, there's a lot of work underway currently on um, looking at island mini-grids um, through different international organizations such as um, IRENA, the International Renewable Energy Agency, which is developing roadmaps for um, specifically island mini-grids looking at bringing in more renewable energy capability onto existing um, mostly diesel generation capacity. So there's a lot of work that they, are, uh, they have underway currently. Um, there's also another organization um, called SIDSDOC, Small and Developing States DOC, that has been um, established over the last several years, which is focusing, again, specifically on the, um, the ways to bring in uh, investment uh, and also uh, policy, the right policy formulations to um, island uh, renewable energy generation capacity um, it's uh, microgrids, but, but also looking at uh, other aspects um, beyond microgrids as well. So there are two organizations that are very specifically focusing on the situation in the islands uh, at present. Um, I would say that, uh, again, there's, there's a lot of different um, across different islands in terms of the way that uh, policies are formulated. So it's, it's a little bit difficult to say um, there's a sort of a global uh, management tool or global approach uh, to this, um, but uh, those are two organizations that are very actively working on um, the specific island context at present, along uh, with others. Excuse like me, Heather, um, this is Peter. Am I back online again? Oh, you are, yes. Thank Hello. you. Welcome back, and I'm going to send the uh, driving back to you. Uh, you okay. know what? No, no, you <laughs> should do the slides for me, though, because I'm coming in through the phone. I don't know what happened to our network here. I got it. Re okay. I got it. And uh, Rashida, did, were, I think you were still answering the question. Yeah, sorry to interrupt, but that's all right. Um, no, that, that's that. fine. I think I think the other the other thing I wanted to just mention is that there is a very strong focus on um, taking islands to be uh, uh, either completely or or uh, as using as much renewable energy as possible, and the Carbon War Room has been working um, specifically on some test cases using the island of Aruba um, to look at uh, um, if, if making it carbon, uh, sort of, uh, um, just really sort of a carbon-free Aruba, if you will, but looking at Aruba as a test case for um, bringing on as much renewable energy as possible in an island context. So I would definitely follow what is going on in Aruba uh, over the next several years. Great, thank you so much. And uh, with that, with that uh, we'll turn this back over to Peter. Okay, um, I still don't have internet connection, so I, you'll have to uh, do the slides. Okay. Um, and, and you'll also have to tell me when I, was, when I got cut off, because I, I, for all I know, I kept going. <laughs> <laughs> you stopped at the end of the first slide, so um, I can move to your Second slide, mini grids are not new. Okay, well, so, sure. Thank, thank you, and I'm sorry, and I apologize. I have no idea what happened to our internet here locally. But um, as Rashenda said, uh, she gave a great definition of, of, of sort of what I would call the clean, smart, new microgrids. But there's lots of um, dumb, dirty diesel microgrids out there. Um, that there, there's millions of them uh, that are, and they're, and they're microgrids in a sense, but they're just really simple diesel generators. Uh, the the uh, challenge with them is that the is the fuel cost. Uh, they uh, their operating costs are unsustainable. So if you look at these island grids, in, maybe in the megawatt scale, you you um, you've got a real utility company there. They've got engineers that know how to keep a utility system up and repair distribution lines, et cetera. They've been collecting tariffs from their customers already, et cetera. They'll typically have multiple generation units. <clears throat> uh, that's one use case. I, I would still consider that a microgrid. Uh, and they still, and they're burning oil. And so they, the economics of renewables is excellent. Uh, so, th so that's a, a, a very important kind of microgrid. And there's thousands of them. 
But if you go down to the smaller systems, uh, the more village power kind of systems that, that are sort of more relevant for and on the energy access issue, um, there's millions of these uh, um, isolated diesels. Typically, it's a single diesel. Um, and it, a single diesel has a hard time providing 24-hour power. So frequently, it's part-time service, only in the evening or something. And, that's not adequate for um, productive uses and economic development. Uh, and our prime candidates for retrofitting with um, renewables and storage to provide 24-hour power in a more sustainable way. And as Rashenda said, there's billions of people with no service at all. And, and, and so the, the opportunities are enormous. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so these clean, smart, hybrid, renewable mi mini grids or micro grids, that's the focus of our discussion here. And the important point is solar and wind are very promising new technologies. Uh, they don't stand on their own. They always have to be connected to, to something else, whether it's, whether it's just a storage system like a battery or a, a big grid like we do in developed countries. Uh, but, but in these applications, it's probably some combination of of, of um, conventional generation like a diesel generator um, and storage. Uh, and uh, there's um, very uh, promising opportunities for load management as well. Um, one of the beauties of these technologies is that they're modular. And that provides the scalability that Rashenda mentioned. But it also gives you a lot of flexibility in the, in the design of the systems. And that's a sort of a two-edged sword. Flexibility is a good thing. Um, but next slide, please. But it can also be um, a confusing thing. Um, could you move to the next slide, please? Oh, right. I'm sorry. I'm, I'm, I'm following you take along. Take a second to catch up. There yeah, no, I'm, I, I'm, I'm, I, that was my mistake. Sorry. Um, so, um, so there's many uh, possible hybrid configurations. That's the flexibility that I referred to. Uh, so it allows you to craft solutions to local conditions better. But it also raises a lot of questions that need to be answered, and and to, uh, such as. How much fuel is it going to use? How much runtime are you going to uh, require out of the generators? Uh, how big a, does the storage need to be? How much autonomy will it provide? How do, and these things all trade off against each other. Um, next slide, please. Um, so we have a, a, a saying that a confused mind says no. Uh, and so I think one of the big obstacles that we have to overcome is uh, this confusion, and that's what I meant by this two-edged sword. The design flexibility is a good thing in many ways, but we give some people too many options. It's confusing, and um, we need to be able to sort through that confusion to move forward and deploy systems. Uh, next slide, please. So people want to know what's best, and and. Unfortunately, there's no cookie cutter, um, one size fits all kind of answer to that question. It really does depend on the application. Uh, what are the resource endowments in the local uh, in the location? Uh, what do you need electricity for? It, um, what are the, therefore that affects your load management opportunities and prices that are falling. So that your equipment choices are changing. The equipment's getting better. Uh, that's all changing. Um, it all affects the design, and so we've been. Our goal has been to address that issue of helping people figure out what makes sense, um, and we bridge this gap between very technical models that look at power quality issues and transient stability, and th uh, that's on a very technical level. And on at, at the finance side, there's you know spreadsheets that you could deploy it when it's towards the end of the, um, the look at simply the finance of it. We bridge that gap by having enough technical detail to understand how the system's really going to work, um, but also providing economic criteria or economic mer uh, figures of merit and results that can feed into a financial model. So um, next slide. just. So to accomplish that, you need to look at every hour of the year. Actually, we go down in the minute, and soon we'll be going down to second by second chronological simulation of how does 
when do the batteries get charged, when do they get discharged, when does the generators come on, et cetera. So you really do know what your fuel consumption, et cetera, will be. That tells you what one system will do. You do that for hundreds of systems, rank them by life cycle costs or net present costs uh, to identify the least cost system. That's the optimization loop, if you will. Uh, that tells you what's best for a particular situation, but frequently we don't really know, for example, what, what's the wind speed in a particular location, or nobody can really predict what fuel prices will be in the future, or what kind of load growth will happen, or how prices will change for, for different components. So it's very useful to have do a sensitivity analysis and to see how does that question of, or that answer of what's best, how does that vary as you vary other uh, factors that you have no control over. And uh, that's the sensitivity analysis. And so we've sort of automated that all into a single package. Um, uh, so enough on Homer. Let me go to the, the next slide and talk more about the market, if you will, or the opportunity that exists for microgrids. And what's really changed in the last couple of years is this slide um, shows, hopefully we're on the cost parity for PV on diesel grid slide, because I'm, I'm following along separately. But, um, yes, you are. You thank are. you. Um, um, that at the same time that PV prices have been plummeting in recent years, diesel prices have been increasing rapidly. And we have now at full par cost parity for PV on diesel grids, which um, the, uh, the folks trying to um, develop solar in North America I would love to see cost parity uh, for PV here, uh, but we but it already exists in against these diesel systems. And this these are some very conservative assumptions that we made for this, which which I won't go over. Um, next slide, please. So up until recently, the up until recently, the um, opportunity for these hybrid renewable microgrids was limited to places that had a really good wind resource. And it's often difficult to determine whether you have a good wind resource. Wind can be a very cost-effective um, technology if you have a good resource, but it's very sensitive to the resource, whereas solar is not very sensitive to the resource. So that's sort of the, the purpose of this picture here, to show that um, you know, across the x-axis, you're going from a, a resource of three kilowatt hours per square meter per day is a, is actually a very poor resource. So that's sort of northern Europe or, or um, you know, um, the northwest corner of the U.S. or something. It's, it's, um, uh, and the right end is six is is not is is a good resource. It's not the best in the world, but you can see that it the cost or the uh, power from PV doesn't vary nearly as much as I think most people would expect it to across a range that sort of goes from, you know, Arizona to Seattle or from, from uh, southern Spain to northern Germany. Um, so what's really critical for PV is the capital cost, and that's what's been coming down so dramatically in, in recent years. Uh, next slide, please. So w back to the bigger picture of, of the different types of microgrids. Uh, and there's many, many different types. So I found it useful to think about, well, what's the value driver, value proposition? Uh, and there's three basic ones, I believe. Access is the one we're focusing on mostly in this um, webinar. Uh, but a very important one also is fuel savings. And finally, there's an environmental uh, or emission reduction uh, value. Uh, so. The smaller systems, the village power systems, are more focused on the access uh, value. Um, and the larger systems, the island systems, they've already got access, but the, the fuel cost is the, is the driver. So you've got a more of an economic uh, driver for it. Uh, eventually, we think there's be a very big market for microgrids in developed countries as a way to integrate high penetrations of renewable power that's more of an environmental driver, uh, and we actually see that developing more slowly than the economic driver, which is really an imperative for um, many of these island nations. And, and there's another piece that, does, that gets neglected, but in most of the world, the utility service is not all that reliable in many, many 
most commercial facilities and will have a backup generator. And if the service from the utility company it really isn't that reliable, that backup generator is going to be used enough that uh, the, the hybrid renewable microgrid becomes a, a viable, economically viable alternative in addition to being quieter, et cetera. So, um, so there's many, many different types of microgrids. On the next slide, I break it out even more, uh, but I just included that for people to go and look at um, later. Uh, so it's, it's, on, it's in the slide deck, but uh, it's too much detail to discuss now. So let's go to the slide that says clean power evolution at the top. Hopefully I am. Um, and, and again, this gets to uh, a, a, a very interesting point that I, that I like to focus on, which is there's been an awful lot of discussion about the smart grid. You know, I'm in Boulder, which is supposed to have it's the world's first smart grid city. Of course, my internet just went down, but it's been it hasn't worked out well. And people looking to large utility companies to deliver this very innovative concept of a smart grid. Um, are, are, are frustrated, and, 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 and it's really not fair. Large utilities have very substantial security and regulatory obstacles to innovation. It's, it's like changing a tire on a car while driving 70 miles an hour. They're trying to keep the lights on, and, and, and then they really can't be doing too much innovation at the same time while they manage this extremely complex continent-scale grid. On the other hand, smaller systems don't have those regulatory obstacles. And furthermore, they have a real economic driver that the large utilities don't have because they're burning oil. So they're moving to re renewables much m m more quickly. And as you get to higher penetrations of renewables, you have to start looking at more sophisticated controls. That, that is the smart grid um, technologies. And so that it's kind of ironic, but I, I think it's absolutely true that the smart grid technologies and practices and concepts are being implemented first on these island grids. Uh, and that's where you're going to see these smart, clean microgrids. Uh, and it will be eventually that will roll back to the large grids. But they don't really have the economic driver uh, that the small grids have to make this happen in the short run. So uh, next slide, please. But let's talk again about the village power, the, the energy access issue for a minute, because I think that's, there's a gap there. I think it's an important uh, problem to focus on. So if you look at the really small end of the, of the spectrum, solar lanterns are very successful because they're a product. They can be mass produced, and they can be distributed the way you distribute razor blades or something. So we know how to do that. It's simple, and it's easy, and, and it's happening. At the other end of the spectrum, What's been very successful are large wind farms and, and solar parks. These are $50 million investments that can afford a team of professional engineers and project developers and financers. And it's, it's an expensive process to develop the, the, uh, the standard project development process. But if you have a big enough project, you can afford the, all the transaction costs associated with that. These island systems are similar in many ways to the larger systems, but they're physically smaller. Um, and they're actually a little more complicated because, because the renewables become a substantial portion of the whole system and have the capability of sort of jerking around the system a little bit. So um, we need a much more streamlined development process to make them happen. Um, but village power sort of falls in the middle. It's, it's too big to be packaged. Um, uh, although we're moving in that direction, that's clearly the direction that, that, that needs to happen, um, uh, whether you call it plug and play or cookie cutter or whatever. It, the more packaged they can be, the better. And solar home systems are somewhat packaged, not as much as a solar lantern. Um, but, but because they're too big to be truly packaged, um, and too small to afford the kind of project development process that works for large wind farms. There needs to be a program so that you can aggregate them. There needs to be much more government support um, to, to, over, to, to make this, these projects developable. Uh, 
Now again, the, the next slide, the, the taxonomy on the top, I've just put in there so it's in the slide deck and you can look at that in more detail. Um, the, the, so let's move to the next slide that says early project development steps are the risky ones. And, and I think that's a key, really key point. So trying to get the private sector involved uh, is, and have them fly around the world and try to develop a lot of small projects scattered around the world, uh, it, that, that's not practical. They, so, the, someone has to get those projects through a, a series of early d development stages before you can bring in the Western finance. And there's plenty of Western finance available uh, once you get to that point. But the, this, and so we're trying to help by providing a tool to do the conceptual design that people can use on their own. And w using that tool, we, it, it, it acts as a screening device, both does the, pro is it a, does the project make sense? Do the proponents of the project know what they're doing? Uh, this is all much easier to evaluate uh, by looking at uh, an analysis through, with, with a, the, home, the Homer software. And it also gives people a, a communication tool to engage the various stakeholders. This is what the project will look like. This is, and, and, and people can share um, the concept around uh, uh, much more easily. Uh, <clears throat> I've, <clears throat> I've put the, uh, uh, the one stage there listed, permissions and contracts in red, because I think that is actually a really key step um, that um, where governments can really help, where public policy can really make a difference, is uh, what's really daunting to developers is at, well, um, trying to understand how to get the permissions they need, um, who do they need to talk to, uh, and every place is going to be a little different. And, and, and so it's, it, that's where you really need some capacity building at the local level because it's, it's, it's people in the local communities who understand that and you can't expect Western finance folks to try to figure that out for every different place they might want to work. Um, so the more the government can streamline that piece of it, um, the, that's uh, be critically helpful. And there's a capacity building piece to it of training local people, both in the, that process, but also in some of the te technical issues. Uh, and uh, finally, they could always help with resource assessment because everybody is going to need that. Um, so next slide, um, which is my concluding slide. The first point is that we believe there's an enormous potential for mini grids, and we're just starting to see the, see um, that come to fruition. But we're just we're truly just starting, um, and that these mini grids are going to demonstrate that renewables can be deployed at high penetration in a stable and reliable way, and the, and and it's kind of an exciting idea to think that that they're going to lead the way. Which is um, which is will be which is an unusual situ uh, but uh, situation, but I, but I think it's important to distinguish between the larger mini grids, where you have a u existing utility company and it looks more like a project development, but it it needs a much more streamlined process, with the smaller mini grids where, boy, you have to kind of start from scratch with creating the institutions that that are going to support the, the, the mini grids. Um, and you really can't afford a project development process. It, it, things need to be as packaged as possible and as, as um, um, standardized as, as, as possible uh, so that you can do multiple, um, you can aggregate them. Uh, and, and so the government has an enormous role to help in, especially in that latter um, problem. And uh, the main things I would focus on would are uh, standardizing the processes, standard, making the, pro the permitting process more transparent, uh, standardized contracts. Uh, the project developers, at least in the U.S. and in Europe, are used to ha um, having 
um, power purchase agreements that are relatively simple, just selling kilowatt hours to the utility. But when you're doing high penetrations of renewables, the, re the renewable project is actually impacting the conventional generation in a substantial way. And so it's not, it's not quite as simple. And so that makes this prob problem even more important to solve of standardizing the kind of relationships that the, uh, of how the parties are going to interact with each other. So, that, so that's a critically important uh, policy issue. The, the other one is capacity building. So, so get um, the, much of the effort here has to be done at the local level. And so the, the uh, um, trainings like we're doing here, but more technical trainings, uh, we, we, do, we do software trainings around the world. But, um, and we should just expand those, but we should also in, in, enhance those or, or, uh, to include uh, some of the development issues, the legal and financial issues would, are, are, are a really important piece so that um, the, all those early development prop, uh, steps in the development process that I talked about can be done locally uh, both at, at, and, and then the local people doing those steps know what the finance people are going to need um, to, to bring in the finance to make the projects happen. So the capacity building is both a technical issue and a sort of legal financial issue. Uh, and, the, uh, and the standardization, I think, are the, the places where um, public policy can, can really make the biggest difference. Uh, so thank you. That was my talk. Uh, I guess we'll go uh, pass it back to Vicki to manage a question and answer session. Great. Um, Marcinda and Peter, thank you so very much. Um, those were both outstanding presentations. And we have had so many great questions coming in from the audience. Um, we'll use the time remaining to answer and discuss um, as many questions as we can. I will warn the audience that we've received many any more questions than we are um, able uh, to provide answers to. Um, I, so I'll just, I'll just begin at the top. This is one question that's come in from several people, so, um, and, and you've explained it in some detail, but if you could recap, um, people are asking what is the difference between mini grids and smart grids and mini grid versus micro grid and rural grids. So um, if you just could quickly give kind of an explanation or definition for each of those, um, I think that would help a lot of the people who have been submitting questions. Um, this is, this is Richanda. I'll take, I'm happy to take a first crack at this. Um, as I've mentioned in my earlier presentation, there is no one universal definition. Um, and this is, this is an area we, smart grid, I'll, I'll let Peter speak to. I mean, that, that tends to have um, certain um, aspects in terms of uh, control systems, um, particularly that's the term that's used here in, in the US. Um, but between mini grids and micro grids, again, some um, practitioners, some policymakers out there do have a sort of a size definition, but there is no one size fits all um, difference between a, a mini grid and a micro grid. Um, and in fact, even some people are talking about pico grids now where you're providing um, small-scale generation services just to a, a few households. So um, that, that said, as, as I mentioned within um, our, our operations, um, as, as we're looking at it through the practitioner network, then gen generally we are looking at uh, sub-1 megawatt. But of course, uh, as, as Peter, I'm sure, will talk about uh, on the island situation, then, then we're looking at uh, multi-megawatt you know, types of, uh, of um, microgrid uh, applications or mini grid applications as well uh, right so the reason that's such a good question is because there's not a very good answer to this question <laughs> um, the the uh, uh, so I, I, I'm gonna uh, tell you how I use the terms and uh, because it's not a standard definition and I mini grid and micro grid I, I think are kind of interchangeable to be honest with you um, and as you can see, our, that was the slides, they kind of jump back and forth. Um, and, and my definition is simply 
a grid that can stand on its own, that's, that's not connected to a larger, uh, or uh, that, e that either is not connected to a larger grid or even, or in, in, if it is, it's still capable of standing on its own. So within, within the, the U.S. there's some interest in microgrids that are, have islanding capability, but that's not what we're talking about here. So I just say any, any grid, distribution grid that stands on its own um, and is too small to use the large, you know, to be, have, have a coal-fired or combined cycle natural gas plant. Uh, and, and so that's a more expansive definition than, than most people would use. Um, and then on the smart grid, again, that is used to mean a lot of different things. Some people think it just means um, meters that can be read um, autom um, remotely. But the way I meant it was um, uh, often an, 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 uh, another term for it is demand response is where the low where you get where, where you the load can be responsive to, to the and can provide um, some of the stability services and, and, and some of the integration services to make variable renewables um, more cost effective so for example, if you have a, um, a battery charging station and a cloud passes over the PV, you can cut back on the rate at which you're charging the batteries um, rather than turning on a diesel, for example. Um, so it's, it, it's a level of communication and control that um, wouldn't have been possible 10 years ago, but at this, at nowadays is actually, from a technical perspective, quite straightforward. Um, but that controls, it's, it's more sophisticated controls which allow you to do renewables at higher penetration. So the term smart grid can mean a lot more than that, but that's the important piece that, for this um, discussion. Okay, great. Thanks, thanks both, to both of you for um, a great answer. I think it clears up a lot of the issues around the differences. Um, our, our next question I'd like to ask because I think it could apply to many. Um, and the question is, for subcontinent-sized country such as India, what kind of microgrids do you envision to be economical and sustainable as compared to mega renewable power producing plants? Well, I think I can, I can address this one coming from the access standpoint. We're already seeing a lot of uh, activity in India with different types of microgrid, different types of generation capacity. Um, I already gave a, a very quick example of OMC Power, who's working specifically in, in UP um, in India. But there are others uh, operating out there, like Husk Power, for example, which is providing um, community-level uh, generation capacity using rice husk biomass gasification um, as a particular solution based on, on the particular, uh, the, the fact that rice husk uh, has no um, alternate uh, value in, in, in those particular communities where they're operating. And they have already developed, I believe, 65 um, microgrids in, uh, uh, predominantly in, in Bihar um, in India. There's a lot of other focus currently as well. Um, the Rockefeller Foundation in the US has an initiative called the Speed Initiative, which is specifically looking at the, the application of cell phone-based stations as the anchor tenant, and then concurrently being able to provide um, community-level access through oversizing the, the power requirement for the base station, and also then um, providing uh, those services into the community, so somewhat like OMC power is, which I believe is a part of the speed initiative, but then looking at being able to scale that up um, thousands of times to, to cover uh, many different areas of India. Um, again, there are specific contexts where um, microgrids are already used in some of the island uh, communities, uh, like parts of the Sundarbans um, in, uh, in coastal India. Um, so so there's, again, there's no one size fits all. It depends on the particular um, uh, local requirements, the, the local, um, uh, using, using Peter's uh, HOMA uh, uh, analysis to really model out in that particular context uh, what, makes, what makes the most sense. Um, I do know that the government of India is, is very actively focusing on uh, the policy aspects of how they can be um, most appropriately uh, 
um, developing their policy in terms of how best to be supportive to uh, microgrids as a means particularly for helping to provide um, energy access to communities that still uh, do not have any access. Um, and again, one of the challenges there has also been the question around who owns the microgrid, who controls it, um, is it community owned, to what extent there's, there's a sort of a, is it a purely um, uh, transactional relationship um, and, and, and what are the responsibilities uh, of, of the microgrid provider in terms of 24-7, um, uh, which is certainly needed for the base stations. Um, but also uh, to, to the local community as well. So that's a very um, great question because it's, it's, it's a very uh, a current um, discussion and, and policy uh, issue uh, right, right now. Yeah, I, I might just add to that that uh, India is a, is, a, is a great test bed in a sense It's because it has such a diversity of app, potential applications. Uh, so there's also so many um, back, existing backup generators there that could be uh, more rational, rationalized, if you will, or could be turned into a, uh, a, a cleaner uh, and more efficient microgrid. Uh, and then, um, so that's a whole other type of, of microgrid and opportunity. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, next question is more along. Uh, design, manufacturing, and installation of many microgrids. Um, the question is, are there specific plans to create workers cooperatives for design, manufacture, installation, maintenance of uh, many slash microgrids? And if so, have funds been committed to make this a reality? Um, do either of you know of any instances? Where well, the is? manufacture of many of the components are well, it depends. Uh, um, I, my first thought was, you know, if you're talking about inverters and uh, and and PV uh, systems, and these are the the manufacturing is kind of a, a a big deal, and 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 a global industry that needs to be very competitive. Um, uh, but if you're talking about assembly of like solar lanterns, I think that that is perhaps uh, amenable to um, cooperatives, uh, but Rishendam might have more to say. I don't know. <laughs> um, if you could, Vicky, if you could just quickly repeat the question. Oh, sure. Hold on one second. Um, okay. Are there specific plans to create workers cooperatives for design, manufacture, installation, and maintenance of uh, mini and microgrids? And and if so, uh, are you aware of um, any funds that have committed? Um, to make this a reality? Um, in terms of plans, I know that there are, I mean, many uh, microgrids are already operated in some sort of cooperative ownership framework. Um, and particularly, I would reference um, microhydro. And uh, for example, there's, there's a member of our network called Ibeka in Indonesia that operates um, microhydro um, uh, mini grids um, on, a, uh, on a cooperative basis. So that that is a an ownership model that is well known, um, and again, I think as Peter referred to, though in terms of the manufacturing side, that that is very much a, a, a global market. So, so I, again, I think it depends on what uh, what aspects are relevant um, to the particular uh, local context. And and here, I, I do want to say one of the um, residual challenges that I see, particularly for for some of the smallest microgrids is in fact um, the capacity of the community to really maintain their own solution. And one of the ways that we need to address this, I think, is much more systemically in uh, many developing countries in terms of them um, incorporating uh, renewable energy training into their vocational education classes um, across their countries so that, um, for example, electricians are trained on different types of renewable energy applications so that we can build the capacity across the country to be able to provide the types of services for maintenance um, uh, of these um, microgrids. And that's something that we're still seeing very much in development, that there are many areas where there has been a tendency to 
expect um, things as a community really that, that we should not be expecting them to be able to do in terms of maintenance beyond very, very simple um, non-technical uh, um, aspects. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, and um, Rashinda, this is actually may, maybe a little bit of a follow-up to the question you answered uh, regarding energy access in India. Um, and this question comes from Ghana. So what would you recommend that developing countries like Ghana focus on hybrid renewable mini-grids in the rural areas in an attempt to close the gap between those with access to energy and those without access, or make our grids more intelligent in terms of the technology input? So that's kind of like a two-part question, and if you need me to repeat that, I'm happy to. Do uh, so. Again, I think I think it's it's um it's a great question. Again, I think it really depends on the local context. I know that Ghana, uh, in particular, is is also um, in the midst of a sea change in terms of its energy production, given the uh, um, the, the the oil and gas production that's underway there on 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 the conventional fuel side. So whether or not uh, that will be able to um, to, to the extent to which they are using conventional fuels for um, uh, increasing grid extension is 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 uh, is something I'm I'm not uh, uh, completely conversant with their, their their planning around that. But certainly, I think um, the 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 answer is a bit of an all of the above. I mean, there are contexts even now where we see that um, uh, certain countries are providing concessions to a company to um, provide a certain amount of, of uh, power to all of its customers and then that, that company, that concessionaire then determines, well, is it done through a microgrid, is it done through a combination of a microgrid and perhaps solar home systems for um, outlying customers um, for whom the, the, the cost of, of stringing wires would be um, too much uh, really for them to be able to, to make it work with this particular tariff structure. So it's a, it's a very, it's a very um, localized question, I would say, and uh, uh, perhaps we can have a future session specifically as it applies to Ghana. Okay, great, thank you. Um, next question, I think this uh, would be one that um, many might be asking is, what are the main steps to build up hybrid renewable mini-grid models? And Peter, that might be, um, if you want to take that one. Yeah, Thanks. sure. Although the word model can mean a lot of different things. So I often mm -hmm. refer to the Homer as a, as a software model. Um, I'm going to guess that the questioner was really asking about sort of deployment models, uh, mm -hmm. sort of demonstration or pilot projects. or you know, I, And um, we, we do have some, uh, uh, some examples or models of, of microgrids. Uh, Rashenda showed one in Senegal. Uh, there's there's a, several in India, uh, and it's happening faster and faster. I think the the most important thing that we can do is to um, act as a clearinghouse, so people all in one part of the world can see uh, models or examples of what of what people in in a completely different part of the world have have done, and then there might be some you know modifications for local conditions, um, but um, really, it's kind of a shame if if there are models out there and nobody and and but and people don't know about them. So, um, uh, I, I think the best thing that we can do is to uh, develop case studies and, and publicize and, and 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 disseminate information about what has worked and what has not worked um, in in various places because there are these models. Our demonstration projects that have been done, and, and it's actually we're beyond demonstration projects in a lot of places. Uh, so first thing I would do is find out is, is find out as much as you can about uh, what's been done in other places. Mm -hmm. And and actually, the, Rishenda's network is uh, the practitioner network is sort of that's kind of its goal. So so that's a great question in a way. Okay, super, thank you. Um, the, this next, I think we have time for maybe one more question before we 
uh, close out. And again, I just want to uh, let the audience know I apologize if we're not able to answer your questions during this webinar, but we'll take a look at them um, subsequent to the webinar and perhaps um, send a few of your questions to Peter or Ms. Shinda to um, answer, you know, via email or something along those nature, along that nature. So again, I apologize if we did not get to your question. We've just had far more questions than we have time to answer. Um, but we will take one more, I think. And um, this is a little bit of a comment plus a question. It states, we at GIZ are currently working with um, Inensis and similar countries and uh, different countries. And the key problem for them and um, for them, their and other micro utility models is investment capital for the movable assets, such as um, generation units. Um, so the question is, how um, can more um, inexpensive capital be acquired, um, such as where the IRR is less than 10%? Um, I'll, I'm happy to answer that one. It's a great question, and, and the answer is this is this is exactly where we're sort of working on all sides of the equation. We've been approached. There is a lot of interest by um, global commercial banks um, in microgrids in principle, but then we're also looking at it from an investor standpoint, which is how how can you mitigate some of the uh, initial upfront capital risk and. As I mentioned earlier in my presentation, one of the challenges in Senegal was, in fact, that there was no um, preset tariff um, for the microgrid, so it's very difficult to come in and, and building a, a fully commercial financial model when you do not already have um, a set tariff in place. So I think there's a, a bit of a chicken and egg, which is having a, a, a set policy, an established policy that is um, stable over time, can also help send the right signal to investors to be able to um, um, have assurances, um, quite apart from all of the other sort of uh, regular um, emerging markets investment uh, challenges that, that one faces, particularly when coming in with foreign investment, that there is that risk mitigation just through having a, a stable policy regime in place, that, that it's known, that it's set, um, and uh, um, therefore you can make projections over time. The other, the other aspect I, I'd like to say as well, which is um, looking at um, vehicles for risk mitigation like uh, risk insurance. You know, Tanzania now has sovereign risk insurance um, for uh, investors coming in there, and there is some activity already underway um, in terms of uh, um, microgrid companies looking at and, and, and investing into Tanzania um, uh, at, at this time, part, in partly because of that uh, that sovereign risk insurance is already in place. So it's also looking at how we can help to mitigate some of the risk to, to enable investors to um, have that assurance that, in fact, if they do invest, uh, they will be able to um, that they will be able to get the expected return on their capital. And then, lastly, I would say I think this is also one of the reasons why um, there's been a tremendous amount of interest in looking at uh, um, the telecom base station case because each telecom tower does need um, uh, stable, reliable um, power over a, a period of years, and effectively um, that uh, you know that becomes the anchor customer where there is a stable contractual relationship with a um, essentially a, a, a fairly predictable revenue stream, and it's that predictability that I think as we can look at. Um, these, these concepts where we can see that predictability across a whole pipeline of potential projects, that that will give more confidence for investors really to be able to, to come into this market. The return aspect, of course, um, again, it really depends on the anchor customers and um, the particular context in a, in a given country or whether you're providing, as, as, as Peter had said, you know, there are there are industrial operations that are also uh, working on, you know, using microgrids now. So it really depends on on your customer base and what kind of revenue revenue generation expectation expectations that you have as well. And from an energy access standpoint, clearly um, one of the challenges is in fact um, this uh, capacity to pay, um, which is why we do see a lot of concessional financing 
really being used, like GIZ, to, to come in and help offset uh, some of the risk um, that companies are taking initially to, to come and work in this sector. And if I could just add that the, the, uh, to that, the, the, what, I, what I think is the biggest financial obstacle is getting the projects to a point where the investors can engage. And the stable uh, policy environment is probably the biggest single piece of that. But there's a whole string of tasks that need to be done to get to that point. Uh, and, it, it's, and, and, and that, ha that all has to be done before or you get the, fi the financial, the Western finance involved, it, it, it'll totally depress the returns to, way too much if you expect the um, financers to do any of those early steps. So that, that all has to be done locally, which is why capacity building is so important. If I may make a final comment, actually, on that question, which is I think the, um, the diesel generation um, stage is, and, and offsetting diesel is, is a slightly different um, uh, investment model. And, 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 and I think that there it's actually much easier in, in many senses to, to project uh, the return profile. And in fact, many small land developing states um, like Barbados are, are looking to bring in more renewable energy generation capacity onto their, um, their island uh, mini grids. Um, and there is investor appetite already um, in some of those islands to, to be able to do that, um, particularly because they've seen the sort of the sweet spot between this uh, this diesel and PV um, uh, price uh, price point, and looking at sort of grid parity now being reached in their particular context, where they may be already paying um, you know 50 cents per kilowatt hour for generation using diesel. Okay, great. Thank you so much both to you for uh, Rashinda and Peter. Um, you know, you've given such great, outstanding, informative presentations today, and um, we've had some super great questions from the audience. Um, so I really, you know, appreciate your time and putting together these presentations. Um, I think you really provided uh, terrific information for our audience today. So um, before we close uh, the webinar, I'd like to just take a, a few seconds to pose three quick um, sort of polling questions to obtain feedback from the audience. Um, and these evaluation questions are important to us because it allows you, our audience, to inform us on what we're doing right and areas where we can improve. Um, so we'll allow you a few seconds to consider and answer each question thoughtfully. And then, um, Heather, I do believe you have the first question displayed right now. So um, attendees, please uh, go ahead and provide your response to this first question, which is the webinar content provided me with useful information and insights. All right, we're going to um, close this question and give me just a couple of seconds, Heather, to capture that. So, and then uh, Heather, can you display our next question, please? Um, and our next question to the audience is, the webinar's presenters um, were effective in providing their information. Okay, and uh, Heather, if we can go to the next question, please. Um, a final question is, overall, the webinar um, met my expectations. Great. 
Great. Thank you, everyone. That was uh, terrific. I appreciate um, you taking the time to respond to our uh, polling questions. So with that, I'd just like to, again, thank everyone particularly. I want to provide a hearty thank you to Rashenda and Peter for um, you know, taking their time to provide these great presentations today. And I also want to thank you, the audience, for attending and participating. And I've had several questions come in about um, where they can, where you all can obtain copies of the uh, PowerPoint slides and also um, review an audio and video recording of this webinar. And I've provided the link um, here, which is cleanenergysolutions.org forward slash training forward slash hybrid renewable dash many dash grids. But if you just want to go to the training page, um, you'll find a link there to this particular webinar and um, you can download PDF copies of the presentations. Um, and with that, I'd just like to again say thank you and um, we look forward to seeing you again at future Clean Energy Solutions Center webinars. Uh, with that, this webinar is concluded.